Uh, so it's been a while since I've done Bird of the Evening and I had to put a bit of thought into what I would want to speak about. Um, so some people know I've recently just moved within the last two weeks to uh, Craven, which is um, about 15, 20 minutes south of Gloucester. And we've just moved to 260 acres here. So I have all of these new birds in my backyard and it's a whole different, um, you know, dawn chorus and soundtrack that I wake up to each day. And um, yeah, sound that I hadn't heard for a while. Um, you know, I used to come across it in surveys from time to time, but um, don't tend to see this bird that often. So I thought, um, yeah, it'd be a good candidate for tonight's bird of the evening. So it can be confused with some other uh, species, Australian species, um, that, it, that it does um, share some characteristics with. So I've just graded out there. So maybe you can have a think what it is. And um, we'll click on to the next slide and see if you got it right. So don't always see them sitting like that up in a tree. Um, that one actually looks quite comfortable sitting there on that perch, but that's not usually what they look like when they land in a tree. Um, so just, just some background for this bird. It's um, generic name, Centropus. So it's a compound of two Greek words that mean um, spur and foot. So that's referring to the very long spur-like inner hind claw of the Senecal kukal. So that's, you know, the, the um, original genus there. And then the specific name refers to it having that long brown barred tail and it being a terrestrial bird um, with a pheasant-like kind of habit. So they're big birds, if you've seen one, they're, you know, average around 60 centimetres with a bit of a range there for the male and female sizes. And they can weigh up to 380 grams. So they're pretty hefty kind of characters and closely related to the, the cuckoos and the roadrunners. So I've just got a couple of pictures there so you can see that they, they definitely look like they're related. And this bird, um, you know, after talking to, to Mick and Emily to get some ideas for this presentation, um, Mick's comment was that um, this bird could be Archaeopteryx. It's really like you can see the link to the dinosaurs there. So I said he's straight out of the Cretaceous period, this guy. So um, I've been waking up each day to the, the beautiful call of the pheasant kukul, if you can call it beautiful. It's an interesting call, that's for sure. And I've actually been hearing males and females doing the duetting kind of call. So that's that's been quite interesting. And I did track one down the other day. It landed in, in a tree. So um, my phone was terrible though. So I've had to rely on the trusty bird image library. So thank you to all these wonderful photographers that um, I've, I've credited at the end, but some fantastic shots in here. So here's the two different breeding plumages. So up the top there, you've got um, the, the breeding plumage with the black head through the neck and all the underbody. And then you get those wings with that beautiful reddish brown, um, the black and cream barring. And it also has the barred tail on the, on the top feathers there. But then in the non-breeding, they go back to that reddish chestnut colour, um, that cinnamony brown, and it's all streaked boldly white. And they've got that red eye that sort of stands out probably more in that non-breeding plumage. So the sexes are similar in plumage, but the females are actually larger than the males. And if you do see a young bird, they're a lot paler um, and they're like non-breeding adults with orange spots on the head, neck and upper body. I can't say I don't think I've ever seen um, a young bird. So it'd be something I'll be looking out for. What does it eat? Um, lots of stuff and some pretty impressive looking prey items. So up the top there, I think this is Rob Palazzi's photo. Maybe he may be able to tell us at the end um, if he's on what this critter was, but it's... Um, it looks pretty massive and pretty juicy, whatever that is. And then Mick thinks this may be his photo, but if anyone wants to, to correct me or him, um, we've got a massive frog there that it's getting into. So that looks some um, pretty nice thing to be eating. And sometimes they'll eat um, lizards, eggs and young birds in, in nests on the ground and also sometimes small mammals. So yeah, pretty varied diet they've got. So generally found in wetter coastal areas across the north and the east of Australia um, in that dense understory vegetation. So on the farm here, we've got, you know, about half of the, the farm is um, grasses. It's um, We've got lots of 
bracken and um, blady grass, that kind of thing. So those sort of typical habitats. And then up north, it's often found in sugarcane plantations and in weedy thickets. So um, I know I've got a bit of lantana to contend with here. So that, that could be another sort of place I might run into these guys on the farm. And um, yeah, often seen along roadsides where there's thick grassy vegetation. So sometimes, yeah, they, you know, they can get hit by cars because they can be, they can come into to contact with vehicles that way. Um, where can you go to see one in the Hunter if you've, if you've never seen one before? Well, I've put a couple of maps there, just the, the top one showing the Hunter region from our annual bird report. So they're pretty widespread. Um, the bigger clusters of records from bird data, the big reds and blues are sort of where you get more regular records. So um, pretty widespread through most of our LGAs, not as many records from Cessnock LGA, but um, definitely records from Newcastle. So you can go to Tomigo Wetlands or or Ash Island, Hexham Swamp. And then if you're down Lake Macquarie Way, you could you could go to Belmont Lagoon. There's lots of records from there. Um, Pambalong Nature Reserve. And then if you're up Maitland Way, maybe check out Morpeth um, and up into Port Stephens around Smiths Lake, look like it was a good area. So I bet a lot of these sightings are from the club. So great to, to see um, how we've added to all these bird data records. Okay, what does it sound like? Um, you may have all heard this before and let's hope that my sound will work, but it does have a couple of different calls. It's a usual sort of whoop, 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 whoop kind of call that I'll play and then um, terrible at doing bird impressions. And then there's um, a metallic kind of tapping call and then there's sort of a rasping hiss call that it, it tends to do more in winter time. So I'll see if I can play this. So that was the, the main sort of call that I've been hearing around the house and it goes on for a good hour or two in the morning and then again in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, just, just some main facts. Lives and nests on the ground, unlike our other cuckoo species. Um, it is not a nest parasite. So it does actually take its parental responsibility seriously. Only cuckoo to build its own nest and raise its own young. Um, and in this case with these guys, dad does a lot of the work. Um, the dad is usually the one incubating the eggs, sitting on the eggs, and then shares the, the chick feeding duties with the mum. And when disturbed, if you've ever come across one, they generally run rather than fly, or they will fly and crash about through the, the, um, the vegetation and then plunge into cover. And yeah, I got a pretty funny look at one the other day when it tried to land in a tree. Um, it sort of flapped about and, you know, almost sort of fell down a couple of branches before it settled in the canopy. So they can be pretty amusing um, birds to see and get a good look at. What does a baby kookle look like? <laughs> I have to admit, I had never looked this oh, up before. Wow. So obviously it's the one in the top left. So I think that they take their design inspiration, their evolutionary um, sort of inspiration there from a few different things. We've obviously got um, Albert Einstein down there with the crazy hairstyle that um, would do the kukul proud. Um, Rambutan, I think it, it kind of closely resembles that fruit. And then of course we've got porcupine. So it's just a bit of a, a bit of a mixture of all those different things, I think. So very strange hairstyle. And um, I guess, yeah, beauty in the eye of the holder. You, you may think it's, it's any of those three or all of those three. But um, yeah, I think, I think they're pretty cute and very unusual looking chicks. So just a little bit about its nesting. It'll usually hide, hide the nest in thick grass and weedy thickets. It's a platform of sticks, um, grass, rushes, lined with leaves and grass. As I said, the male usually incubates the eggs and they'll both help with the feeding. They can lay more than one clutch in a season and um, they breed between September to March. Um, generally three to five in the clutch and just the incubation and nestling periods there sort of around the similar time frames. So I'll be keeping my eye out and um, yeah, hopefully I might, um, yeah, record some breeding here soon. So just want to, now, now this is the other amazing thing. So that's four chicks in a nest. Obviously maybe that, that white stuff looks a little bit like straw or helps with camouflage. I'm not sure, but um, they are certainly the strangest looking little chicks I've seen in a nest. 
And I just want to thank all the um, amazing photographers there and um, some other places I was able to pull things off, off the web and um, obviously our, our wonderful bird report and, and bird data that, um, yeah, is very easy to use to do these kinds of birds the evening. So thanks everyone for listening and lovely to see you all.